Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from the Beyond Solitaire podcast, and this week I have a fascinating guest for you, Professor Rex Brynan. Would you like to introduce yourself, sir? I certainly would, uh, Liz. Uh, I'm Rex Brynan. I'm a professor of political science at McGill University in Montreal. I've been a hobby gamer since forever. And fortunately, I get to put those two things together quite often because I work on serious gaming, uh, political and military gaming, war gaming for the military, uh, planning games for UN agencies and all kinds of stuff. So I brought you on today for a very specific topic, one that is most timely because we are in the middle of the end of the United States election, (laughs) Uh, where, you know, at the time of recording, in case people listen to this down the line, Joe Biden has very obviously won in terms of the popular vote and in terms of the electoral votes he should be allotted. But Trump is currently refusing to concede, peddling conspiracy theories on Twitter, generally angering his base and... Not the entire Republican Party has not stepped forward to acknowledge Biden and his transition. So we're in a weird place in American history at this moment. But Professor Brennan, you gamed out the entire election before this. Well, we get, we gamed out what we're going through right now. So we gamed out the immediate aftermath of the election, a scenario in which uh, Joe, Joe Biden won the election, but it was close on election night with the sort of mail-in ballots uh, tipping it over into the uh, into the Biden category. For gaming purposes, everything hung on, on Pennsylvania, uh, which was not far off the mark. And yeah, so we ran through the sort of uh, from the election through to early January. January um, in in the U.S. And that was done for the the New Yorker. There had been another big gaming project that the Transitions Integrity Project had done. They looked at what might happen in a contested, uh, difficult uh, election transition. Uh, And the New Yorker thought it would be cool to do the same thing. So they contacted me and we quickly put a, a game together that we ran over two days. So what kind of research and prep goes into running a game of this nature? Well, uh, it depends on, on the game format and it depends on the topic. Uh, obviously, I'm not only a geeky gamer, I'm a geeky political scientist. So, you know, uh, cable news is hot in this house pretty much 24-7. And, and uh, we Canadians had been very closely following with some alarm developments south of the border. Uh, the participants that the New Yorker brought in, mainly their, their own staff writers, are almost all political journalists. So this was all stuff that they knew. So In this particular case, and because of the game approach we used, which was a Matrix game, which we can talk about in a minute, uh, we didn't have to do a lot of of preparation. Uh, We wrote up the scenario. Uh, We frankly used Google Docs and Google Slides, which are amazing for distributed online gaming because everyone can see them and everyone can access them and everyone can change them. Uh, We stepped through the scenario. Essentially, we had sort of four turns, as it were, at different points in the the game, uh, spent about... uh, I don't know, four, four and a half hours over two days playing it. Um, And, you know, the participants brought their own knowledge, whether it was of election law or Pennsylvania politics. Uh, You know, our our participants knew an awful lot about the players they were they were representing in the game. and uh, so we didn't have to do as much preparation. I've, I've designed other games uh, for serious purposes in which, you know, it can take uh, weeks or months of research to put the game design together. But because of the topic and because of the game format we use, this this was done pretty quickly. So who were the players in this particular simulation of the of the election? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be slightly coy here, and and there's oh, I don't mean reason. humans, I mean factions played in. Oh, the game. Okay, okay, yeah, no, that, I mean that there's there's a story behind the game and why it didn't get published, which we we might briefly address. Uh, but uh, there was what uh, what we call an unfortunate glitch during the game involving uh, one of the participants, and if anyone uh, reads the article about this on on Pack Sims that I wrote, there, there's a link that will explain the unfortunate uh, uh, glitch involving Jeffrey. 
Andrew Tubin. Um, but uh, we had someone playing uh, the Trump, uh, Donald Trump and the Trump Pence campaign. We had someone playing Joe Biden and the Biden Harris campaign. We had someone playing the rest of the Republican establishment, whether that was was, you know, Congress or whether that was at the state level. We had someone playing the rest of the Democratic Party establishment again, whether at Congress or at the state level. And then we had two extra establishment actors, one on the right. You know, proud boys, militias, etc., and and one on the left. So there were essentially six main players. We also had someone playing the court system. So when things went to the court, we had someone who was a legal expert, uh, sort of uh, addressing that, and we had someone playing uh, the Pentagon, uh, National Guard commanders, uh, sort of the security component when that issue came up in the game. That is really interesting. You've thought about a lot of the parties who are now involved. Um, so what kind of actions were you able to take in this game? How did that play out? So, so let me explain how a Matrix game works, because it's it's very different than most of the games that most of us uh, play for fun. In, in a Matrix game, a player can literally do anything. Um, they, they simply describe the action that they wish to take. They describe the effect that the action would have if it was successful, and they articulate the reasons why they believe their action would be successful. We then go to a broader discussion amongst the rest of the players about the pros and cons. Yes, that would work because of this reason. No, that wouldn't work because of that reason. So we have a discussion over the intended action and the chances that it would succeed or have the intended effect. Uh, and at the end of that, we poll all the players on probabilities. So you know, how likely do you think this would be to work? And again, if the players are subject matter experts, which they really were in this case, um, and you ask them to sort of step out of the roles for that part of the game, uh, you end up with a sort of distribution of probabilities, which is pretty close to expert opinion on how likely that would be to succeed. You simply choose the median probability, and then you roll a pair of percentage dice against it. So it's a very simple technique. It does not require designing a game engine in advance because the players are adjudicating every action uh, as it comes along and, and they can pretty much do anything that their real life actor would do. But if they go for a long shot, it's going to be a long shot because, you know, we'll end up assessing a low probability of, uh, of success. When you roll the dice, if you roll really, really well, then it's gone super well. If you roll terribly, it's really backfired. And if it's somewhere in the middle, it's, yeah. Um, so that was, the, that was the game system. So players were really free to do anything that their real life actor could do. What happened in the game was that the Trump campaign started complaining about the mail-in ballots and complaining about fraud uh, and launched a series of legal challenges against counting mail-in ballots or trying to get ballots disqualified which went nowhere because courts at, at both the federal level and at the state level simply said there's no evidence of systematic fraud. Uh, you know, that might be a tiny mistake one way or another way that happens every election. We're not throwing out votes. Um, so that was that was like the first step from the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign essentially said, yeah, we're just going to we're, we're, we're teed up, ready to fight these things in court if we need to. But we're not going to make we're going to go kind of slow and steady. Um, and, and I must say the Biden campaign throughout the game played it out almost exactly the way the Biden campaign has played it out. Now, when that didn't work in the game, the Trump administration began to escalate. In what sense do we mean escalate? I thought you might ask me that. So uh, the first thing that happened is that they kind of did a Portland all over again. Uh, they announced that they were launching an investigation into fraud and sent federal law enforcement to post offices in Pennsylvania uh, because those are federal property. So much as they deployed, uh, you know, uh, uh, Border Patrol and so forth to, to Portland to protect federal property, they use the same kind of model to send federal law enforcement uh, to, to post offices. Uh, the problem was there were very few ballots still in post offices at that point. I mean, obviously, as you probably know, Pennsylvania allows 
votes that were in the postal system and had been postmarked by election day to be counted after the election, um, provided the postmark is, is correct. Um, so there were very few ballots actually there, and the ballot counting places were not areas of federal jurisdiction. Uh, so federal law enforcement couldn't really be sent to the ballot places. But nonetheless, the, the governor uh, assigned stepped up state patrol to those areas. So we had a, had a bit of a, a standoff with uh, sort of increased federal law enforcement presence in Pennsylvania, which didn't have much of an effect, um, and the state getting a bit nervous and, and stepping up protection of, of counting places. Uh, we also saw on the right activists um, faking videos of, of ballot fraud. A couple of mail trucks went missing and were found in a river, uh, which sort of contributed to all the online rumors about an election being stolen, which the Trump administration was fanning on Twitter. And on the on the left, we had uh, sort of sit down peaceful vigils around uh, counting places and, and post offices in protest over the federal government's uh, actions. So that really didn't change the counting of the ballots. So what happened in the game was much as it happened in real life, the sort of tick tock, tick tock, tick tock of the absentee ballots uh, gradually, both in Pennsylvania and across the U.S., uh, increasing, shifting it to a, a ever-growing Biden lead. Um, at that point, the Trump administration tried to push uh, the Pennsylvania Republicans, uh, the legislature, to appoint their own electors to to you know not accept certification of the Pennsylvania vote and to appoint their own electors to the Electoral College, which is exactly what we've seen the Trump administration do in both Pennsylvania and Michigan unsuccessfully. Uh, because in the game, as in real life, uh, local Republican elected officials weren't prepared to go the route of overturning what appeared to be the popular will in their state. They just thought the, the, the political costs downstream for them would be immense since they would be seen as, as overturning the, the will of the voters in their state. So the Trump administration in the game, like in real life, it would appear, was unable to get the... Uh, uh, like local Republican legislatures to overrule uh, voters uh, in the appointment of, uh, of members of the Electoral College. At that point in the game, we started getting a rising level of background violence because there was a significant minority of the U.S. public who felt the election was being stolen. President Trump was tweeting madly from the White House about uh, this all being fake news, about how he really won. And there were a number of incidents of violence. There was arson against some Democratic Party uh, facilities. There was, uh, you know, uh, some pushing and shoving at, at rallies and counter rallies. And it began to overtax local law enforcement in Pennsylvania, at which point the Pennsylvania governor decided to activate some National Guard units to backstop local law enforcement, and not to be put in the front line, but was being told by local law enforcement and state police that they just did not have the personnel to guard counting places, deal with rallies, deal with demonstrations, deal with sporadic violence that, that was occurring. So the National Guard was called up very carefully. There was a concern about National Guard commanders possibly making things worse or the optics of it which then became much worse when the president started tweeting about federalizing National Guard assets in Pennsylvania under the Insurrection Act. The Pentagon at this point was extremely concerned in the game. Uh, and one of the interesting things was the military uh, carefully preparing to be unprepared. That is to say, the Pentagon did not want to have to respond rashly to a rash request from the president. So they put considerable effort into saying, oh, that will take time, sir. We're not sure we can do that, sir, um, because they were worried about being pushed into uh, a situation as they were in Lafayette Park, you know, clearing Lafayette Park and uh, Chairman of Joint Chiefs being used for the photo op. They didn't want that to happen again. There was some concern about some U.S. military commanders. Uh, who were believed to be more brash. So quite interestingly, our military expert, who's, who's an absolute leading national security reporter, said privately these conversations are occurring about you know, who, who, is more, who is more cautious and who is more reliable. Um, the other thing that occurred was in the game, uh, the Russians really piled on. When the violence started, 
there was a lot of Russian cyber activity to to try and increase the level of polarization. A lot of you know uh, bots out there, a lot of fake tweets, a lot of fake Facebook. Uh, on both the left and right, just trying to destabilize the situation and promote uh, polarization and violence. And the Pentagon decided to take um, um, offensive action against some Russian cyber capabilities, so taking down servers and so on and so forth. They did so without requiring, without requesting presidential um, approval for that, that offensive cyber attack on Russian capabilities, arguing that it fell within their current remit, that in other words, the current orders to US Cyber Command do allow it to respond immediately without prior presidential approval. And they, they sort of did it, they didn't talk about it. Uh, I think they assumed the president, if they asked him, he might say no, or it might become a big political issue that they could interpret their orders in a way that it was consistent with their orders and that the incoming Biden administration wouldn't have a problem with it and that it was a national security priority because it was just the Russians attempting to throw gasoline on a on a fire. At this point, a little bit of violence, uh, you know, a lot of polarization, um, concern about if you're a Pennsylvania National Guard soldier and your governor has mobilized you and the president is tweeting at you, you know, whose orders are you supposed to follow? Is a tweet an order? The president hadn't actually formally invoked the Insurrection Act. It was just kind of wild tweets from the bunker where presumably he's got Wi-Fi access. Um, at that point, the stock market began to tank. As, as it looked, if it might get really messy, uh, the stock market went down. And at that point, the Republican establishment and Republican donors said, look, this, this, we, enough of this, this, this could dangerously escalate to violence or destabilize the economy. And you began to see the Republican establishment more and more recognizing Joe Biden as the president uh, elect cautiously. Uh, there were attempts to cut deals with the Biden campaign. You know, if we come out formally, um, is there something you'll offer us in terms of legislative agenda? The Biden campaign said, nope, we're going to win. <laughs> we're, we're, we're confident in the end that, that you know, the laws of the United States will, will put Joe Biden in the presidency. So we don't feel you have anything to negotiate for. Uh, and sure enough, the Republican establishment began to slowly talk about Joe Biden as the president elect and slowly walk themselves away from the president's rhetoric. So we ended up with sort of widespread consensus that the, the Biden administration was going to take power. The Republican establishment having sort of played footsie with the president's wild claims at the beginning, but having backed off of them and the president angrily tweeting and thinking I mean, about where he was going to go at the end. So it was pretty close. There was a few things that were wrong in there, uh, but I have to say, and hopefully we don't get to the bit with growing violence and the Russian pile, Russians piling on uh, and, you know, National Guard call-ups. There have actually been some National Guard call-ups, but, uh, you know, the, a lot of it in the terms of the main dynamic was, I think, really close to what we've got. That is really interesting. I guess I look back on it. So... First, I just want to comment. I got to tell you, I would bet that there are attempted kind of deals going on between the incoming administration and the Republican establishment. I bet that they do maybe want a little something, something in order to come out now and speak up. And yeah, it, although it the, surprise me. the view in the game uh, was <laughs> that, that the Biden campaign doesn't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. that. That all it does is it creates problems with the left wing of the Democratic Party and they don't have to do it because they've won. And so, so, you know, the sort of quiet Joe Biden, I'm not going to get into a big back and forth. Yeah, it's the, the, you know, it's annoying that there's no transition planning. We'll put up the heat a bit, uh, maybe because, you know, I've got lots of fresh friends on the Republican side in the Senate in terms of personal friendships. You know, I might be working that a bit, but I'm not going to make any promises on on judges or legislation or anything else, because in the end, I win this. So, you know, what is the Republican bargaining power. You know, in, in the end, I will be president. Um, and I'm not going to compromise on sort of my, my political agenda right now because I don't need them. If only to be the fly on the wall or in someone's hair at this particular moment in our history. Um, so I, the, the thing that's so interesting about the way this game played out is that, you know, as we watch the news unfold about this election, I have to tell you, I feel upset and horrified by a lot of the things that I'm seeing. But I would be lying if I said that I felt surprised. Do you feel like the reason the game played out this well is because really the writing was already on the wall and this was inevitable? 
or does it just feel that way because hindsight is 2020 uh, and 2020 yeah no i mean i i i i think it was evident that the president didn't want to leave we had seen the trump campaign set up this issue of voter fraud for months you know for months and months and months and months you know the, that that uh, uh, making it easier for people to vote would be a problem <laughs> you know you can't trust the ballots blah blah go vote twice i mean we had months of warning uh that this that this was going to be a key element of the strategy if they lost we had the sort of uh you know federal response to to black lives matter and you know protests in washington or portland so we had you know that parts of a template there which in fact has not come to to, to be quite so much in, in real life as as obviously in the game we did also have in the game the trump administration causing calling for a giant MAGA rally outside the white house so that's another thing we we got right um but i think a lot of this was not that surprising if you'd been following closely. I mean, it would have been surprising if we'd been talking about it 10 years ago. I, I don't think you'd say people will be gaming out the possible collapse of U.S. democracy um, oh, and God. it would be a real thing that they would be worried about. You know, that wouldn't have been on our, our bingo card 10 years ago. Uh, but, you know, the, the U.S. transition had a lot of people worried. I mean, I, I, I work in government. Uh, I spent a little bit of time as an intelligence analyst. Um, all your allies, I say speaking as a, as a Canadian, were really, really worried about about this. Uh, you know, so this was not this was not a weird topic. Uh, this was this was something that was being talked about in, you know, in every government in the world. Um, where might the U.S. go? And how messy could it get? And we're not out of that that process quite yet. Now, I think that Donald Trump's options are rapidly closing. It's you know it's clear he's not he doesn't have an, a a legal foot to stand on. It's clear that you know, Republican legislatures in in states are not going to throw themselves on their swords and possibly destroy their parties by overruling uh, the will of the electors in their state. It also has to be said that it's clear that an awful lot of election officials, regardless of their party affiliation, just did their job and did it really, really well, and are in fact are not hyper-partisan. They're more committed to a clean and fair election. I think that's been really evident in how smoothly the election ran during a pandemic with massive you know, uh, absentee voting and all the political context. I mean, I, I could, as a non-American, make comments on how bloody messy your electoral system is, and you know, it's got to be one of the worst in the world. Uh, <laughs> with gerrymandering and an electoral college and arcane laws that people don't understand what they mean and uh you know the strange way you count ballots and the fact that you don't have one giant national election commission and that this is all politicized um i mean speaking as a political scientist our you know, our kind of our jaws are dropping that anyone would run an election like that in the modern era but that's a separate issue Indeed. I have many personal opinions about that that I will not voice. Yeah, well, I work. I mean, my mainstream political science stuff is is elections in transitional countries after civil wars, and they're never run as messily as US elections are, you know, with, with the degree of controversy and mixed voting systems and uh, you know, what have you. Yeah. Pretty oh, pretty much in the rest of the world when they're planning elections, you say, look at how the US does it and don't do any of those things. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So just 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 a long checklist of, of how it gets done. Don't have, you know, 50 plus jurisdictions with X mil, thousands of counties all doing it slightly differently uh, with arcade laws written 100 years ago that were not actually clear what they mean until someone tests them in, in court. And uh, uh, not to mention gerrymandering because of the way that state legislatures get to draw uh, lines for, for the House of Representatives. I mean, no one else would ever run an election that way, but. That's a separate issue. That's a separate issue. Yes, and one worthy of its own game. I think there are games about it, but there uh, there is a really good game called gerrymandering, which is awesome, in which you go around drawing electoral districts, trying to win the election. Uh, you've all got you've got the same number of votes. It's really just all about drawing the boundaries so that your votes uh, 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 do best. So anyway, but yes, back to back to this particular game. Yes. Yeah, so you mentioned COVID. I. If I recall correctly, in your version of the game, uh, Trump declared a COVID vaccine as an October surprise. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, so uh, and and I mean, what we needed it really wasn't terribly part part of the gameplay. Uh, we needed something to get us a closer election than the polling was suggesting when we were designing the game. So in fact, it was a it was a close election. But you know, just part of the backstory was what were the things that allowed Donald Trump to come closer to victory than a lot of the the media coverage was suggesting at the time. Uh, now, some of the polls, in fact, weren't that far off when you sort of factor in their electoral college effects and so on and so forth. But it, it wasn't, you know, in fact, COVID-19 was not oddly an important part of the gameplay. I mean, it was there, it was there at the backdrop um, as the game is going on. So each turn, we are giving them a whole bunch of fake headlines, right? So they're getting fake news, there's those sort of fake newspaper headlines and, and fake tweets. And we were piling on in the latter part of the game that, you know, the, the the death toll was going up and up and up. So, you know, that was that was a realistic part of the game. But it really, in, in terms of playing that period from, we've started to count the votes through to the electoral college meetings, meets. So th- those weeks, COVID-19 is really not a major factor in, in how the uh, how the players took their moves, as it were. Interesting, especially because it's just such a huge factor in the day-to-day life of a normal American voter. But I really do question how much impact it had on the election itself, other than in the number of absentee ballots that were cast. Well, I mean, it fundamentally changed the, the way in which people were voting, right? As you say, the number of absentee ballots was much higher, and that was uh, predominantly Democrats in, in most places. And hence, that was a target for the Trump administration trying to trying to you know, suppress vote counting. Um, but it, I, and it certainly, you know, normally one would expect that Donald Trump would have comfortably won the reelection on economic performance, you know, an incumbent with a pre the pre COVID economy. So if COVID hadn't hit, you would normally expect an, incumb- an incumbent with a buoyant economy, which is, which is what we had before COVID uh, would win comfortably. Clearly not only the economy, but the Trump administration's handling of COVID was the thing that that led him to being a one-term president when the when the basics before covid would have generally pointed to him winning real re- election i just want to say by the way to make sure i get it right to any listeners i mentioned the game about gerrymandering it's called map maker i couldn't remember the name of it when i was speaking earlier it is a s- incredibly simple game which instantly tells you all the key teaches you all the key dynamics of how you gerrymander electoral districts it's such a clever clever game uh, but anyway, yes. So back to back to the, the, the game we run. So, so you know, COVID set the stage for why Donald Trump lost the election, I think. But in terms of the maneuvering around the election results, it, it was not the major thing. I think the other observation from that that we should pull that's interesting is that, you know, you had a whole faction that represented, you know, say the Proud Boys or the far right. But the fact is that, you know, nearly half of the country is not the far right and there were other factors in play that you know led to this election being as close as it was and it's interesting to hear you talk about you know the economy and belief in a buoyant economy what that can do to vote results um you know how how much of a role did the far right play in this game other than just being difficult at the very end well, I mean, they they played a significant role because uh, they, first of all, they fed the president's paranoia, as I think you do in real life. In, in other words, um, uh, you know, the, he retweets stuff and I expect he believes half or two thirds of it. Um, you know, it, it's always hard to say with Donald Trump. Does he know he's lying or does he not care that he's lying or does he believe this stuff? Um, and at a certain point, it actually doesn't make any difference. But they are they are the ecosystem. If you're Donald Trump, everyone is telling you that there was tons of fraud. You've got Rudy on the phone saying, oh, we've got 100 affidavits. You know, uh, uh, you've, your, your, your Twitter feed is full of people repeating it. Um, Fox News is increasingly not part of that ecosystem. But even then on Fox News, there's still a lot of coverage of the, the, the fraud allegations. And you start watching Newsmax and when they call the election, you turn to One America. So he lives in an information ecosystem which reinforces certain views. So yes, that far right is not a large part of the electorate but they have a disproportionate effect on the information system within which people are operating. And it's always been the case that that party activists and people who vote in primaries represent the more ideologically 
uh, motivated part of the voter spectrum, right? So, so party dynamics, um, you know, leadership selection, winning your primary uh, in order that you can run for office again, particularly in the U.S., because you have a primary system that most of the rest of us don't have, a very institutionalized two-party system, uh, means that if you're a politician, you need to pay attention to your base, and your base is disproportionately um, submerged in these information ecosystems. So one of the game challenges is making players play that correctly. In other words, you don't want them to play a cartoonish view of other people. Um, it's, it's fair to say that our person who played Donald Trump didn't vote for Donald Trump. Um, so you don't want them to play a buffoonish, cartoonish version of the actor. But on the other hand, you want them to, to be subsumed in the kind of informational environment that that actor is. So I'm always very careful when I'm writing up the briefing documents that those briefing documents are spun so that they portray information in a way that would, uh, you know, that, that represents the way that, that that real actor views it. So, you know, uh, often, not just with regard to elections, you know, I did a lot of gaming of the counter ISIS campaign, uh, you know, same thing, the briefing documents that, that ISIS got were very different from the ones that the Kurds got or the, you know, Iraqi central government or disaffected Sunnis. And you want to kind of play up their grievances and even tweak the information. You know, there's no reason when you're playing a game that the briefing documents for each player need to have the same information and in the, you know, you, you can put, they can all argue over what the real numbers are. Uh, so you, I, you, you really got to, one thing we know from, from serious gaming is that that narrative engagement matters. You know, it's just, you know, you think about hobby games. Yeah, I really want to get sucked into the role. When you're doing serious gaming on which policy decide, depends, and this was not policy, this was journalism, but on which policy decides, you've got to make sure that your players internalize the role. And it's not, they're not playing it in a cartoonish, uh, buffoonish way, or that they're not playing it as if they're someone else. You know, if you're running around a lot of Palestinian Israeli games, uh, you, you don't want, someone playing the Palestinians who's who's behaving like an Israeli would. Um, I, it wasn't usually a problem because I always had Palestinians playing my Palestinians. But you can see there's a lot of, uh, you know, getting your participants to, to role play the appropriate way is actually pretty important for one of these more serious games to actually be useful. Yeah, it sounds like your Trump did a really good job. I think the thing that is hardest, especially about someone, you know, so... You can probably already tell I'm no great fan of our current president, our outgoing president, but he is an exceptional person in many ways and has inner workings that I think many of us do not fully understand. And if you just dismiss them, then the things that he does become more unpredictable than they might be if you were really watching. So how did the player who was being Trump make decisions as Trump, but then also successfully participate in kind of those group matrix game decisions about the probability of something actually happening. Was it hard for that player to essentially take that long shot knowing it was a long shot, but feel that that was in character and also accurately assess the probability of it working? Um, I mean, this can be a problem when you run a matrix game. Uh, you know, people can kind of cheat. <laughs> they don't want the action to succeed. So they give it a 0% probability, even though they don't believe that, just because they want to, you know, affect the median result when we do the polling, um, if you're using that particular adjudication technique. Uh, the advantage here, uh, and I've, I've run matrix games with diplomats, military personnel, rebels, <laughs> humanitarians, um, you know, I've run matrix games for uh, you know, biosecurity, agricultural policy, I've, I've run a lot of matrix games. Um, a, a lot of professionals are quite good at it. So, you know, a lot of diplomats or intelligence analysts or agricultural economists will understand that it's a valuable intellectual exercise and they, they shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't be cheating. But the other thing is that p political journalists are very good at stepping away from their personal views and being analytical if they're good political journalists. And the other thing that's a real value when you're playing a matrix game is they make really um, compact, cogent arguments, <laughs> right? In other words, in a matrix game, everyone's got to make, you're all making their arguments about whether it would work or not work. You've got to watch that a single player's action doesn't end up with two hours of discussion. 
Um, diplomats are the worst. They love to talk. Um, but however, political journalists who go on television all the time where you get six or seven minutes for your interview and each answer has to be 30 seconds to 45 seconds are actually really good at, uh, at communicating um, uh, arguments or analysis very compactly. So I must say it was one of the best groups I've ever worked with in terms of being able to process a lot of intellectual information thoughtfully, but also really quickly. Interesting. So I have my own ideas about this, but I'm going to ask you, what is the point of a simulation like this, of a game like this? Why so, do we do it? So, I mean, in this particular case, it was frankly, the New Yorker uh, read about the Transition in Integrity Project games, which had got wide coverage in, you know, the Washington Post and the New York Times and CNN and and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and they thought, oh, that's really cool. We have a radio hour. What we should do is we should run one of these games and then edit it into a into a radio show. And the uh, radio show didn't didn't broadcast, uh, um, but that, that was the intent. And they were super happy with the way that the game went. Uh, just other stuff that happened during the game they, they didn't want to uh, uh, to keep in the news cycle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, people could all find the article, but I'm not going to go into the details of, of what happened. Um, so uh, uh, it was a really high quality game. And for them, I think they found it really useful on stream. They were really happy. Now, I've run these games on African swine fever, major threat to the pork industry in North America. In that case, the client was Agriculture Canada. They've spent years worrying about what is a multi-billion dollar threat. If, if you're a pig, African swine fever is a hell of a lot worse than COVID-19. It's got a 95% fatality rate. And it's three Ooh. times more infectious. Um, but they've been planning for years. They just wanted to run through a game to kind of stress test their operational planning to see if there was something that came up in the game that they hadn't thought about. And also so that different people working in different silos, people working on biosecurity, people working on agricultural economics, people working on, you know, interaction with stakeholders, pork producers, uh, pork processors, that they all were seeing the same picture because in a large bureaucracy, you're only working on a tiny part of the problem and you can lose track of the other parts of the problem. Um, uh, you know, so I know that the, the, the I know one government that ran a what happens when Robert Mugabe loses power in Zimbabwe game at their embassy in her, in, in, in Zimbabwe uh, to prep their diplomatic staff for, you know, some of the politics that that might follow. Um, you know, these games all get used for different purposes. Uh, and, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout is being gamed, I'm sure. I know it is in Canada because uh, I'm involved in that, but I'm sure it is in other places just as a way of stress testing the plan. You know, what have we not thought about that maybe comes out in a game that doesn't come out in other ways? So, you know, the purposes of serious games vary, but usually they're kind of intellectual cross training. They're kind of okay, we thought about this, let's think about it in a different way and see if we come to the same conclusion. And if we do, that's great. That probably means our other analysis was right. And if the game by putting human beings in context where they have to interact, whether competitively or cooperatively, comes up with a different finding, maybe we've missed something. Maybe we've missed something about the perceptions of stakeholders. Maybe we've missed something about the difficulties of coordination. Maybe we failed to anticipate what the bad guys would do, you know, if you're gaming against ISIS. Um, you know, so the, the game is just a different way of having a go at the problem. It's not magical. It's not always right. Um, but it's just a different way of sort of testing your brain cells around a real problem. In this case, I think they wanted to explore how things might come out. I think there were some interesting findings that perhaps had not occurred to everyone about civil military relations. Um, I think a lot of the journalists were pleasantly surprised by how the court system operated. And, and I think that has been one thing that the game correctly anticipated that's been a bit of a surprise to some people that all these you know, all these court cases are going nowhere and they're frequently being dismissed by Republican judges. That, in other words, judges, in fact, are not as partisan on the bench as some of the media coverage would lead you to, to suggest. Um, you know, split decisions on the U.S. Supreme Court are actually the exception, not the norm. Um, it's just that the split decision ones tend to be the big cases that get, get publicity. And, you know, at the federal and, and state level, uh, judges, you know, so so that was actually, I think, one of the things that the journalists themselves learned when we got a sort of deep dive, um, because, you know, our legal expert correctly was arguing, no, judges are not going to throw out folks. 
they don't like to do that. They almost never do that. It doesn't make any difference what party they're from. They're not going to mess around with, with votes. And once they're judges, they don't actually care too much what the party who, who appointed them thinks because they're judges now. So that, that I think actually was an important finding and a bit of a corrective to some of the paranoid, you know, uh, Republican judges will throw out votes simply because they were appointed by a Republican or they were Republican before they became judges. Yeah, I confess to some level of paranoia about that. But you know what? I've actually, I'm a, I live in Georgia, so we've had some excitement. Uh, our election results just got certified. And I have to tell you, it's very interesting also to be in a place where a runoff's about to go down. But I was very pleased with our, our Secretary of State yeah. and how serious he was about doing a good job, keeping a good track of the recount you know, being willing to stand by the work that he did. I'm sure that he and I would probably not like each other much in person or agree about the vast majority of things in life, but it was really comforting to see an elected official do their job where I live. Yeah. And, you know, and I think one wants to multiply that by the tens of thousands of people who make elections work. You know, not just the state level, but the county level, all the way down to the ballot counters. You know, most of those people have political opinions. Um, and generally, you know, we've had some high profile cases about certification in Wayne County. But, but when you consider how many certification decisions are being made, often by split panels of, of Democrats and Republicans with absolutely no controversy whatsoever, you know, most people actually did did their did their job and considered that and put a lot of work into it because this was a hard election to run. This was a really hard election to run. And it's amazing that there were word problems, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, in, in, in many cases, you know, in, in fact, in most cases, the proportion of sort of the kinds of things that go wrong in an election normally, like someone forgets to upload some results or a machine breaks or, you know, those things actually happen in elections everywhere in the world, even that you never get. 100%, you get 99.99% accuracy. We've actually had in the US election less of that, despite all the attention, despite having to shift to new systems and absentee ballots and higher turnout in most cases and so forth. We've had, and having to socially distance and, you know, uh, um, it, it, it's enormous amount of work and it's, it's you know, full praise to uh, everyone, whether they're, they're Democrat, Republican, independent, don't care, who put in an enormous amount of hours and days and weeks and months to, to, to pull that off. So, you know, I, it's a shame. It's a shame they're not celebrated more because it was really a quite remarkable piece of, of, uh, uh, of you know, doing of, of achievement. Are you saying that some goodness and order might ultimately emerge from our chaotic electoral system? Well, I mean, if you want to ask me the long term, I'm still extremely concerned about the United States. Yeah, I, 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 I think that, that, you know, 2024 could be far worse than 2016. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I you're, confess you're, to you're, some. You're, you're not out of the woods. You know, I, you know, um, you know, here and, and there will be, you know, listeners who may, who may disagree with me. I think Donald Trump was enormously corrosive of U.S. norms. You know, uh, I, I've, I've worked when I've worked in government for, for, you know, both political parties. Um, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, it's not that I think that all Republican presidents have done a, a terrible job in terms of institutional norms. I don't think they have. Uh, but I think Donald Trump is an exception that does, has done enormous damage in terms of polarization, in terms of weakening institutions. But he's also, although he's got a certain cunning, he's also not that bright. I mean, he does things stupidly. I mean, he alienates people he doesn't have to alienate. He is not a brilliant demagogue. He is not a brilliant populist. He's got populist skills, but imagine if you combine that with real organizational skills. Imagine yeah. he was a bureaucratic genius or a legislative genius or a coalition building genius or an institution building genius or a legal genius or all of those things as well as Donald Trump. Well, like I'm a Latin teacher and I can't help but look at Julius Caesar and think about the downfall of the Republic. You know, you had a lot of people kind of breaking rules, getting to be consul extra times, getting to run too young or not following certain rules. And then Julius Caesar comes along. He's going to be beset by lawsuits. If he gives up power, he doesn't want to. And so congratulations, you ended up with a dictatorship. And he was an exceptionally intelligent, cunning person. And America did not get a Julius Caesar and Donald Trump. But what happens when we do? 
I, I think I think we're all worried about it. and I think the Biden can, the Biden administration is going to have a real tough time of it. Uh, you know, they, unless unless control of the Senate flips there, there may be gridlocking government. They will be emerging from COVID-19 with a depressed economy. Uh, the U.S. is in massive fiscal overreach. You know, for, for we have all in all jurisdictions and appropriately so borrowed hundreds of billions of dollars from our kids to pay for this as, yeah. as we need to, but you know, we are going to have to have less of everything for a decade um, in order to, to pay for getting out of this crisis. And that's, I'm not saying we shouldn't have done that, but there is not going to be a lot of spare money floating around for things for the next decade. So, so we could have, you know, uh, the, 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 the Biden, uh, a Biden administration having trouble getting things done uh, with some fiscal compression, having to say no to things that parts of the party understandably want to have. And that may meet, make, uh, um, and, and, and Biden probably, I don't think he'll run again in, in after four years. Um, no. So, you know, we're, we're, there's, I think the U.S. be in a position where the Republicans ought to be able to mount a very serious challenge. In other words, I think some of the some of the normal advantages of incumbency may go away. Now there could be pluses. It could be that everyone is so happy that things are better, even if they're still tough four years later. I I don't know, but I I do right. think that twenty twenty four could be a you know uh, the Biden the Biden administration, even if in my view it's infinitely better than the one it preceded, is still seen as having not delivered a magical recovery where everything went back to normal and a super you know progressive impre uh, impressive um, uh, legislative agenda that uh, brings all kinds of new people enthusiastically on board. I mean, I, I think it could be a disappointment to a lot of people for structural reasons, leaving aside whatever Joe Biden does. I mean, it's a really bad hand. You know, sometimes you play a game and you just start with a really bad hand and it's hard to catch up. Um, and so so that, I, you know, I, I don't think that the U.S. is is out of the woods on that. And I, I don't I mean, it's not just the U.S. thing. I think that this has highlighted how fragile democracies um, can be. Um, so, you know, I don't want to I don't want to be the Canadian picking on, on the U.S. I, I do think that, uh, you know, we, we've seen other places, Hungary, Poland and so forth, where there's been a, a steady erosion of democratic norms. And Hungary is a good case because uh, Orban, I think, is a, a lot shrewder and more skilled political leader than Donald Trump is. And we've seen how far things have gone in, in Hungary. Indeed. So, well, you know, I guess we'll be gaming this out in another few years and I'll have to interview you about it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy to come back. <laughs> so on a, on a lighter note, just to cap off the podcast, uh, what are you playing for fun right now? You are also a hobbyist gamer. I, I'm playing absolutely nothing for fun whatsoever because I'm gaming COVID-19 uh, things for, for government. Um, and all those requests come at the last possible moment. And so you know, you get no sleeping hours. I must admit, I, I, I am still playing RPGs. I'm still playing D&D. So uh, uh, Dudley Duddleson, the, the fighter, you know, heroically faced off against local brigands uh, last night. Um, so I, I am doing that. But um, that's largely because it was already scheduled. I didn't want to say no. Uh, usually I run um, uh, zombie apocalypse 28 millimeter miniature games over zoom with with small cameras so that everyone's getting a street eye view of the zombie apocalypse which is be absolutely awesome um and i'm starting that up again in in december so i've been doing a lot of miniature gaming because it really does look like a first person shooter but with miniatures when you when you do the scenery and the camera right and then i was doing a series of again miniature modern micro armor stuff uh, board gaming um has kind of dropped off because i don't like board gaming much on vassal or tabletop simulator or what have you uh, rpgs absolutely love Roll 20 for a variety of reasons including the fact that i don't have to ever go over to my house and therefore have to vacuum um in advance um and with miniatures actually we're playing things in which using cameras and fog of war actually makes the game better um you know if you're doing the zombie apocalypse you ought not to know what is in the alley until you go in the alley you shouldn't be able to look from the tabletop and see that there's a zombie around the corner behind the dumpster so uh it, it makes it really spooky so i i haven't my, my board gaming has declined because i like board gaming in person Still, that miniatures game sounds amazing. And we know you're busy, but where can people find you online if they have further questions for you? So, um, I mean, I run this website with a bunch of other people called PAX Sims, www.paxsims.com. 
hobbygamingstuff.org, which is uh, largely about serious gaming. I mean, hobby gaming stuff creeps in because we're all hobby gamers, but it's it's largely about serious gaming. Uh, my contact information is is there. I mean, if, if uh, uh, my academic email is, is rex.brian at mcgill.ca, it's easy enough to find me on the McGill University Political Science uh, uh, website. Um, but PacSims is the way because, you know, most of the cool stuff I want to talk about, I post to PacSims and I've got, you know, half a dozen other uh, associate editors who are constantly posting stuff on on just about everything, um, including a cool announcement that will uh, will appear on the Zenobia Award. Um, you're, you're broadcasting this after the award will be announced, but there's a, a bunch of people who've put together an award to encourage underrepresented groups to get more represented in gaming. So by the time your people listen to this, they can Google the Zenobia Award. And it's a, a really cool initiative in which I've been involved in a very secondary role. Yes. Uh, full disclosure for everybody. Um, you're on the board too. Yeah, we're both on the board. I am. We're both on the board. Yeah. 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 But I'm just, I'm just, uh, you know, aware of the fact that we're not supposed to launch until tomorrow, right? <laughs> yes. And this podcast is going to run Monday. So basically, yeah, yeah. when you so hear this, coy. it'll be the day after the Zenobia Award happened. <laughs> well, but they'll be listening to your podcast for years to come, right? So I should hope. We don't actually know when they'll be listening to your podcast. I mean, people will go back and listen to it over and over again and tell all their friends. That that is the dream. Wait, wait, hopefully, hopefully you'll be doing a podcast on the Zenobia Award. So I I in fact will. So be watching out, everybody. But um thank you, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate having you come on and talk to me about this election while it's so raw and while it's ongoing. So thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure being here. Thanks, everybody, and happy gaming.